Well, what a pleasure uh, to be with you today, uh, Wang Gongwu. Today we have an opportunity to talk about uh, leadership in the context of education uh, and higher education. You have education in your bones. Your father was an educator. Did that have an influence uh, on what happened to you in, the, uh, in life and career? I think that was a great influence on me. My father was very much an educator in every way. He could have done other things, but he chose to do education as one of his um, key training programs. And his first job was as a teacher, and he came out to Southeast Asia as a teacher with a mission, because those days in the 1920s, he thought of himself as having the responsibility to re-educate the Chinese in Southeast Asia about China, teaching them the language, the culture, and the literature. And so he, he saw that as part of his uh, life work. And, but I don't think he expected to stay the rest of his life in, in the region, but he did. And, so, and he went on always in the field of education. So school teacher, principal, inspector of Chinese schools, and then back to being a principal of a high school again. And uh, he devoted his life to that. And I, I respected him for that very much. And he was very, very much respected as, a, as an educator. So I... Uh, that, that influenced me a great deal. Were you academic by accident or design? You came out of some turbulent moments. You had time in mainland China just before the uh, uh, victory of the, of the communists. Uh, looking back, was it inevitable you were going to go the academic route or what, what, what happened? No, nothing really prepared me for that. In fact, to be fair to my father, he, he, he wanted me to be well educated, but he never expected me to be a scholar. He never thought I had the temperament for it. I think he knew me better than I did, that I, I wasn't the scholarly type or academic type. And he never encouraged me to do that. But he just encouraged me to learn, but not much beyond that. And as a student, uh, I, I, I was much more interested in things happening on campus. I got involved in all the student activities that were prominent at the time. I just took part and enjoyed every moment of it. I, I really was... Uh, someone who, who thought universities were marvelous places to, to grow up in. And I had many friends, took part in all kinds of activities. Uh, attending lectures regularly was not my favorite pastime, so to speak. I, I spent much more time doing students' union work, societies, associations. And because of the turbulent period, as you call it, I got very interested in politics, student politics to begin with, but related to the politics outside, being aware of what uh, political changes were occurring. So even in China, it was a transition between the Kuomintang at, on its last legs on the eve of its defeat by the communists. So I was conscious of that. But coming back to Malaya with an emergency going on, a, a war with communism on the doorsteps, and a, decolonization going steadily and the British about to leave and uh, leaving behind people who had to think of what, what they're going to do with the, with the heritage, so to speak. What, what, do they, what are they going to make of it? What do they build out of what they're going to receive? All that was very much in the minds of people. So on the campus, we, we spent a lot of time talking about that. Not only in terms of the politics, but in terms of the society, the culture, the language we're going to use, the, um, the kinds of things we, we need to do to make a, a new society. This was very much in the, in the, in the conversations that we had uh, almost every day on campus. So that was much more interesting, and I confess I spent far too much time on that and not enough on my studies. As a scholar, as a writer, as a researcher, uh, after you finished your degree in London, uh, you were, uh, came back to University of Malaya, later went to Australia and uh, established a scholarly career. But you took a twist, and that twist was that you uh, did academic administration, administration in the sense of leadership roles in institutes, and then uh, at the University of Hong Kong, where you served as vice chancellor starting in 1986. Why, why did you want to do university leadership and administration. Many scholars don't want to go that path. To be honest, I never wanted it and never expected to be, to be that. But at the academic level, 
involvement in how the university is run was inevitable because um, I was put in positions of having to take a keen interest in that because very early on I had become, I was elected to be the Dean of the Faculty of Arts. And then I was made professor, I was head of a department. I was head of department in the University of Malaya in Kuala Lumpur for nearly 10 years. And when I was in, asked to go to Australia, I was head of a department, the head of the Department of History in the uh, research school. So, and then I became director of the Research School of Pacific Studies. It sort of followed because the fact that you wanted to see academic work done properly, you had to be involved in how um, funds were distributed, how young people were encouraged, how their careers could be supported, how to make sure that what the university does is doing good for the society, for the people around you, to your gra for your graduates, you're really helping to make good careers for them. All these things involve you in more than just your own research. I mean, I try to keep, keep that up at the same time, but it was inevitable because I kept on being put in positions of heading this or that, and uh, I was reminded of the fact uh, when I finally gave up my last uh, headship of the East Asian Institute, I had been head of something or other since my first election as Dean of Faculty of Arts in 1961. And it's not a matter of choice, it's one thing led to the other. And uh, I guess people asked me to take on things because I was thought responsible enough or that I cared enough. And uh, you asked to do it, then you, you, as you understand it, it it's important to you your students and your colleagues that somebody does it. So I began to do all these things. So when the question came up of being a vice chancellor, something I never thought of doing, I guess I wouldn't have wanted it if it was just any university. To be honest, I think you, the idea of being vice chancellor of the University of Hong Kong was particularly appealing because of the timing. As someone who's devoted my life to history by that time, and this was a historic moment. Not only was Hong Kong the last main major British colony to be decolonized, it was doing something which none of the other colonies did, which was to be returned to its original home and to, to work out the transition of how Hong Kong can do that, not become an independent country like all the other colonies had, but to be, become part of China again and a China that was so different in almost every respect from the system that was operating in Hong Kong, the temptation to be actually present to see how this <laughs> happened was probably greater than anything else. It wasn't the administration of a university that attracted me. I, I'll be very honest, I think that was the greater pull, was the chance to be there to see how history actually happens and how this would end. I had no idea and I was very curious to know how things would develop, how the people of Hong Kong would react, how the people in China would get to understand Hong Kong, what the British in London and the leaders in Beijing would sort out for the future of Hong Kong. It was extremely intriguing and uh, fascinating. You had a double challenge. One was the continuation of the change of the University of Hong Kong from a, uh, a British-oriented uh, institution uh, into uh, a little bit different kind of university. But of course, the other transition was preparing and protecting the University of Hong Kong for reintegration into the Chinese world uh, in a direct way. How did you take on that latter challenge? How did you uh, want to situate that university so that it could uh, survive and thrive in a, in, a, in a different context. I have to say there are two aspects of this. I had uh, some idea, some knowledge about University of Hong Kong from very young days, from early days. When I started as a young student, I had spent uh, six weeks at the University of Hong Kong starting my first research project, in fact, in 1952. <coughs> so I had fondness for the university and then every now and then I would go there to attend conferences, to give lectures. So I, I, I knew the people reasonably well. And then I was invited, quite to my surprise, to be a member of the university's grants committee for Hong Kong, 
this was before I became Vice Chancellor. So I sat on that grants committee for several years to understand how the how the system worked, how money was distributed, how the funding was uh, arranged. So I learned quite a bit about it beforehand. So I I didn't actually go to Hong Kong with a totally new new a new perspective. I, I I was already part and parcel of it to some extent. What I you you're right to identify the challenge. The challenge was how would this university survive in the new context and how would it be treated? And I was concerned that the university should be respected as a fine university. And I realized that when I con- contacted my colleagues in China, my or my counterparts in China, I realized that the Chinese had very genuine respect for the university that had an international reputation for good research and teaching, and its graduates were, were, were good and re- respected everywhere. And that if Hong Kong can succeed in doing that, then it's really safe. The university will be treated with great respect. So my colleagues in Hong Kong, you also understood that. So we, we got together to work out how to do it. And the biggest challenge to me was a university that had been primarily a teaching university with very little resources for research and not encouraged to do that by the colonial government and not, not funded for that, how to achieve that, make that change to the, so that its scholars are respected for their scholarship, not just for their teaching. And that was a major challenge. We had quite a, quite a, quite a bit of trouble doing that because many of my colleagues had not had resources to do research. We managed finally to pr- pr- uh, persuade the Hong Kong government to give us the funding. So the research grants uh, committee was set up and uh, money was made available. How to make sure that my colleagues who had not been doing this for a long time to actually make good use of the funding, to justify the funding and actually to produce research work of the quality that is internationally recognized all within a few years. That, that was quite a challenge and I must confess, I, I don't think I finished the job and my job, the job was finally finished by my co- colleagues, my successors. It took us quite a while, but I, I think I, we started on the right track. That was the right way to go. And all my colleagues were determined to, to, to make that happen. It took us a while, but I think it has now more or less got there. You know, it's sometimes said that working with professors uh, and trying to lead them in a direction is like trying to herd cats. Uh, what, uh, any, any specific uh, examples where there were there situations in which you learn something about academic leadership uh, at your Hong Kong days, some, some important lessons that you learned? I think that probably your, your description about cats would be very unfair to my academic colleagues. I think they were, they were actually quite persuaded hmm. that the university was at a turning point and therefore were equally determined as I was to make sure that the university could come out of this period of transition, the kind of university that the, the new relationship with China would not cause any difficulty and will actually persuade the Chinese in China to treat this university with respect and preserve its traditions and allow it the full autonomy that it had enjoyed. To achieve that was what we had in mind. And my colleagues, I think, shared that. They, they realized that, that, was a, that it was a, a, a genuine problem and an end worthy of their efforts. And I think they all, without, uh, without exception, did their utmost to support me you know, on that particular issue. I mean, we have other issues which are you know, a range of other problems, but that particular one, I think we had no real difficulty. Everybody recognized it, but how to do it? Because some of the, my colleagues just simply hadn't done any hmm. research for a long time because there's simply no funding. So they spent most of their time just con- concentrating on being good teachers and they were very responsible teachers and very good teaching records. But on the kind of universal standards of universities today, not to have a good research record as well would have handicapped all of disadvantaged all of them. So we had to try and transform their, in a way, their mindsets to give equal importance to research and to get them back on the track and get them to put up projects which would 
earn them grants, and then to make full use of the grants, to have products at the end of it all, publications which are worthy of the funding. All that was 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 very tough. Was very tough. It was it was hard going for some anyway. Some of the younger ones had no problems because they come out of PhD program, they could do that. But the ones who've been the middle group who'd been had 10, 20 years without that kind of support, for them to, to, to do that, it was really quite, ch- I can understand that. It was not, it's not an easy thing to do. So we, we were quite patient, we encouraged, we tried, got the support that, offered the support that we could, whatever support we would give them. And I'm glad to say at least half of them responded very well. So within a few years, they were, they were producing very good work. But others found it more difficult. So it was that sort of challenge. <laughs> Looking at your career, what's the most difficult decision you've had to make as an academic leader and educator? There were lots of little difficult decisions, but I don't know what the biggest one, but I, that, that'd have to go back to my, to my young days. I guess the, the decision to be a scholar was a very difficult decision. I had never been much of a scholar or much of a student. I had never followed my studies properly and studiously as I should have if I wanted to be a scholar. So when I decided to be one, it was really an uphill battle for me to not only change myself to live in a different way, but to keep my mind focused on things which I had not taken seriously before, and to set aside all the things that I've been doing and enjoying so much before. As an administrator, as a university leader, what was the hardest kind of, we talked about the problems that you addressed in Hong Kong. Was there a decision point that was particularly difficult or challenging? To me, at least looking back, one of the most difficult ones probably the most difficult ones, was the kind of balance that a university needs in its staff. Students are fine because students, we we get the best possible students from your own country or from even neighboring countries. But the balance of the staff is a difficult one because we need people who also know the country well. Most of them would have to be local. At least to know, if not just Hong Kong itself, but Hong Kong is neighborhood, South China, and China, because the population is part of China. And yet, at the same time, to have enough of people from outside to bring new, fresh ideas, to challenge some of the accepted uh, traditions and so on, to look afresh at things, to get the right balance to make it a, a fruitful mix of people who can re- interact and really produce new things. Mm-hmm. If you're, if you're too many, if you're imbalanced, but too many people from outside, it, it changes the nature of the university. A university cannot perform the role that, that society expects of it. And so you have to have that balance. Now, that's not something you can artificially do. You, you have to allow some natural talents to emerge, and yet at the same time, you cannot be total, let it to be totally free. You have to guide it to some extent to get the right balance. And I think uh, in, in the case of Hong Kong, we did face that problem because at the beginning, of course, the staff was almost entirely from outside Hong Kong, part of the colonial education system. Uh, and then we were replacing them with a lot of Hong Kong people. But then you don't want to go too far. That, that becomes too narrow and parochial. You know, the danger of that. And what we don't want to have is just simply reproducing ourselves. We want to have really new, new people come in. So trying to get that balance, I mean, that's not for one vice chancellor. It's a, it's a university must take on as it's, as it's a full responsibility. Every generation must continue to keep that in mind if that university is to, to perform its best for the community and at the same time be a great university. I think that's a tough one. Uh, you mentioned as a student, uh, you uh, spent a lot of time involved with political things and uh, learned some skills then. Can universities teach leadership? I've never been taught 
leadership, so I, I <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't know whether you can or not in a university. I think what, what, uh, what I understand is that universities can provide you with the, the kind of knowledge, the skills, technical skills, and, um, mastery of certain methods of doing things, how to get things done, learn some degree of efficiency and sense of timing. You can teach some of that, so that at least the technical side mm. is all available to you. Whether you, as a person, are interested in being a leader, or have the instincts to respond when leadership is required, because it, very often you don't, the thing doesn't arise. Most of the time we are not, we're not, we don't live to be leaders. Mm. We, we live to do all our things and so on. But when su suddenly something happens, we require somebody to take the lead, someone emerges and offers to do it. Or you just point to somebody and say, so he's the person to, to take us the next step forward or something like that. How that happens is a, is a mystery to me. But it happens. I've seen it again and again. I mean, there's a problem. We all sit around and talk. Mm -hmm. And it becomes obvious that so-and-so should actually take the lead. And that person does. Mm -hmm. Maybe all of us could have done it. E each one of us could have done it. But one person stood out as the person most likely to succeed, maybe, or, or something mm -hmm. like that. And, or that person volunteers. He's quite willing to sacrifice the time or whatever it is and, and finds it quite natural and effortless or to just stand out and, and take up the issue and take it one step forward. Whether you can teach that, I don't know. But I think every one of us, if we learn enough from what we study at the university level, we should be mentally and um, physically ready to take on extra burdens beyond what the, the normal work you do. And you just know when you have to do it. I think you, you, you get the sense that something needs to be done and somebody has to do it, you look around and maybe you're the person to do it because nobody else seemed to be interested or something like that, you know. So I, I don't actually know how you can teach that except to give people a good education. Hmm. Then everybody's ready for it, you know. And, and, but if it's not required, you don't do it. But if it's required, somebody will come up and say, I'll do it. As you survey the educational landscape in East Asia and Southeast Asia now. Who, who, who are some of the leaders of the future? Who do you think are the people that are going to build the institutions? What are the, is there an example or two or a person or two who you think that in the way you've been a leader over uh, 50 years of a, of a career, who, who's, who's the next generation leader? Oh, I, I can't claim to have been that kind of leader. I, 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 uh... My, my work is a very simple work compared to the kind of responsibilities that uh, the kind of leaders you're talking about would have to face. I don't know of anyone I can think of uh, in those terms. I think you put it, you're, you're set their bar too high for, for, for anybody today. I think um, the last half century of nation building after decolonization for most of the countries mm. in Asia have been very challenging ones and very, very difficult ones. Many of the borders are not borders drawn by any e evolving sense of where the borders should be, but drawn on the map with lines on the map. And the people within those borders have to find ways and means of living together harmoniously and peacefully. It's been extremely trying and exhausting to many of the leaders that I, I find. And therefore, the struggle within to look for a, a, a system whereby they could ensure a longevity and, and, and continuous development has led to all kinds of distortions, too, to the various systems. Political struggles to a power, all these are enabled by the fact that so much is unclear, so much is not yet determined, so many of the values that people are seeking are not, not, don't match. And the contesting the conflicts between people with different value systems remains very much on, uh, with us in, in different parts of Asia, different degrees, but different parts of Asia. Uh, that's a major challenge. And I think the leaders have all been so occupied with that that they haven't had too much time to, to offer more 
you know, future-oriented uh, ideals. They're struggling to build something out of something that wasn't there. What kind of leader is necessary going forward in education? And what kind of leader uh, does Southeast Asia need going forward? If we confine ourselves to Southeast Asia, we are talking about 10 relatively small countries in the world. So they have to be, I would say the region should produce a group of leaders who understand that as leaders of small countries, they must learn to work together and not be picked off one by one, so to speak. And it's being united to be able to learn to develop sh shared values in the sense of community is probably the biggest responsibility for small countries in a, a region like Southeast Asia. Different countries need different kinds of leaders, but when you're small countries, it's, it's not enough to be just a leader of your own country, but to sh understand that all the small countries in the region have a sh shared fate as small countries and that the only chance of being left alone to develop the way you want to is to share that work, that responsibility together. If in 50 years people look back on your career and the 50 years of work you've been doing in, uh, as an educator in, uh, in the world and in, and in Asia in particular, what would you like the one word to be chosen about what you've tried to do and what you've achieved. What would you like that next generation to look back and say, Wang Gungwu did fill in the word? One word? Well, <laughs> three words. <laughs> Actually, the word that I have, uh, I have used quite often, not sure that it's the most important word, but it's the use, I've used it often, is openness. I've used it partly because I'm conscious of the history of China and because I've studied it for so long and I felt that uh, China did best when it was open and whenever it stopped being open and tried to close down it created more problems for itself than it needed but each time it opened up to the world the new ideas, new peoples, new, new systems, new methods and so on it flourished so open is one of the words that I, I, would, I would like. To, and I, I believe that having an open mind for an educator is also very important. A university should be open, teaching should be open, open to new ideas, open to be challenged. If all my students, pupils, all the young people can share that openness, I will be very proud. Thank you for a wonderful conversation. Thank you for the chance to talk about it. <laughs>